Okay, I think we are live. And I'm just going to record here as well. Record to the cloud. Okay, hello everybody. It's great to be back. We have fantastic guests with us today. We have Brian and Erica McKay, and I hope I'm saying the last name properly. No. Um, these two are relationship coaches and they work with couples two on two, which we'll find out what that means in a little bit, but pretty cool. Uh, so I'm so thrilled to have you here with us. I I've been communicating with Erica and Brian and I was like, I have to introduce them to my audience. They're such great people. I love what they're doing and they're here to share more about what they're doing as well as you can drop some questions in the comments if you'd like, and we can do those in real time if I catch them, but often I'm very focused on the guests so that we can have a great and uh, really in-depth uh, conversation here. So thank you so much for taking time out of your day, the two of you. I know there's a lot happening on your end, having a six-year-old and <laughs> also running a business. So thank you for being with us today. We're so blessed to have you. Thank, thank you. you for having Thank us. you for having us. Oh, I'm glad. And you, you, you're in Florida, right? Correct. Yes, yep. Fort Myers. Okay, Fort Myers. Yes, we have a few people in the group that are from Florida and right. hopefully uh, able to make it today. They were actually um, like, if my client cancels, I can make the call today. So they <laughs> are <laughs> really excited. Uh, and I, and I, this particular person I'm thinking of, uh, they actually would love this. Um, being in a newer relationship and and uh, possibly the one. <laughs> oh, that's exciting. Very exciting. Very exciting. So what is premarital relationship coaching so that we can understand that a little bit more and, 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 and really uh, I would love after that to know how you got into this. Yeah. So what we do, I'll just kind of explain what we do and um, what it looks like to work with us. Um, we have our program kind of broken up into three separate sections. So the first thing we do is we start off with life coaching for the individual. So it's really working on yourself in the container of the relationship, because if you want to improve your relationship, it always starts with yourself. You have to look inward before you start looking outward and improving, you know, your outside world and, and relationships and things like that. So looking at things like what are your wants, what are your needs, desires, um, figuring out if you have any unrealistic expectations, what they are, any kind of like unconscious patterns. Um, I mean, what else? Looking at that, <laughs> the polarity in the relationship. Yeah. And um, how to make polarity, Brian, can you, um, cause I hear that a lot in, in the coaching realm and I, I, I have a feeling my audience is going and like, what does that polarity thing mean? And how does it apply to me? It's, it's actually a really cool concept. So um, if you look at anything in the universe, everything is dual. So a good example of this is if you take a magnet. So if you have every, every, you know, magnet has a positive side and a negative side. If you take a negative with a negative side, what's it going to do? It's going to repel. Whereas if you take, same with a positive and a positive, yeah. though you're going to repel as well. Right. Yeah. However, if you take the opposite, if you take a negative with a positive, it's going to attract. So it's literally the same with us as individuals with the masculine and feminine energy. So when you're in a relationship and you've got one person that's in the masculine and the other person is in the feminine, everything is balanced. It's harmonious. It's a beautiful partnership. And you also have that attraction. You have the, the spark, you have the, um, the, the, the uh, magnetism, the attraction, all of that when you have that polarity. And something that we end up noticing once we dive into this concept a little bit further is there's oftentimes people that are in the same polarity. You've got sometimes a feminine with a feminine or a masculine with a masculine, and it causes a lot of headbutting either way. And then, you know, years down the road into a little bit further into the relationships, you know, sometimes people have been together 20 plus years and they're kind of in the roommate stage of the relationship. They're like, we're not having sex anymore. There's just no passion, no spark. And then we do a little bit of um, a little bit of assessing of their situation. And we find out that, oh, you're both in the feminine energy or, oh, you're both in the masculine energy. And there's no more play of that polarity. So oftentimes once we see that they don't have that spark anymore, 
the polarity is oftentimes the culprit of that. Mm -hmm. This is a, a, a great example is Erica is the external processor. I am more of the internal processor. Oh, I, and, see that. <laughs> I can totally see that. <laughs> and so if you have two externals, nobody ever gets a word in edgewise. And if mm -hmm. you've got two internals, nobody says anything and it just doesn't work. So you need that polarity, that complementary opposites to um, really kind of create that fulfilling relationship. And that's what you guys do is you help people to identify what is happening in the relationship and how to navigate if they are more in the masculine energy, both of them or both in the feminine and, and basically how to reestablish that polarity in the relationship. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, that's a great example. So typically, like if there's two masculine energies, there's going to be a lot of headbutting and a lot of fighting. Mm -hmm. If there's a lot of, if there's two feminine energies, there's going to be a lot of talking and a lot of, you know, just being mm -hmm. and nothing's ever going to get done. And that's where, again, you need that polarity and, to make the relationship effective. Right, right. And do you find the one that's just talking, they're not really talking about the important things, they're talking around the things. Oh, absolutely. Especially, so the thing with the feminine energy is that, um, they find connection oftentimes through communication. So what ends up happening, especially if they don't have certain communication skills, they end up just kind of talking about their emotions and not really accomplishing anything. And the other thing kind of on the opposite side of that, that we can um, oftentimes see happening, particularly with the two feminine energies that are together is either they kind of talk in circles, talk, talk, talk about things that aren't really um, moving the relationship in any direction, or they don't talk at all because they don't have, I don't want to, I guess the word that's come to my mind is the backbone um, to be able to really effectively present their partner with the issue at hand. So they end up kind of just keeping everything inside and then the same thing happens. They get, there's no change, no growth, nothing. The relationship just stays kind of stagnant. Yeah. So yeah, what I'm hearing is that you're really talking about the, in, the being the initiator of issues and the developmental change that it takes to step into initiating what they're desiring, what they're thinking, what their thoughts are, uh, what some of the issues they're concerned with are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah absolutely. and it, it, that's an, impor an important part of the process, because oftentimes what we find is that people don't really know these things about themselves. We will ask people, I mean, it happens on almost every single consultation call we have, like, what is it that you want? What is your ideal relationship like? What's your ideal future like? If we start working together, what would that look like? What do you want in the future? And they just say, I just want to be happy. Okay, right. but what will actually make you happy? And then they have no idea just completely, completely lost. They know they want happiness. They know they want connection. They know they want more sex, but they don't know the specifics Anything of it. beyond those generalities. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So the premarital coaching, uh, relationship coaching really helps them to identify more specifically what they want in, in their relationship and how to get that and set that North star so that they can start moving towards that direction in their relationship. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that, that honestly el eliminates a lot of problems in the relationship it is, you know, so often couples end up competing with each other and jockeying mm -hmm. for position mm -hmm. and things rather than working toward that North star goal. And as soon as you get on that North star goal, all the little shit just doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. Right, because you're united on the bigger picture. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. So how did you guys get into this? Like what drew you into this and have you has you working in this field now? That's quite the story. <laughs> so I, I guess I guess I'll start. Again, version. So, <laughs> um, so I, I I was married previously before Brian. I actually got married when I was 17. And wow. yeah, yeah. I, I started dating my first husband when I was 16. Um, he was eight years my senior. So he was he was into his 20s. Um, and then we got married when I was 17. And I did not fully yeah, expect, you don't, depending on the no, state. No, my mom actually had to sign. So my mom had to sign over guardianship to my then husband. But it was one of those things like she wasn't necessarily all for it, but wasn't necessarily against 
liked it because she actually liked him. He knew my family and, and everybody liked him. Um, but it was one of those things where like we got married in August. I was turning 18 in December and she's like, well, you're just going to get married in December if I don't sign this in August. So, um, yeah, yeah. So needless to say, 17, basically still a child going into a marriage. And I was hit with real life. Like I, I didn't understand, you know, oh, we got bills now. I have all of these household chores that are on top of me. I'm a, I have a full-time job, you know, all of these things just came at me. I wasn't expecting that that would happen. And the other thing I wasn't expecting was that I, back then I didn't know anything about limerence or the honeymoon phase. I was under the impression, you know, the, the Disney model of when it's meant to be, it'll be. And, you know, I found my Prince Charming. He's going to make me happy no matter what. We're going to ride off into the sunset, live happily ever after. And I was, that and was the rudest. Yeah. I crashed and burned. <laughs> that was the rudest awakening, you know, four, four years down the road. I'm like, I, I don't even know that I like this person because you know how it goes when you're in, you're in the honeymoon phase, those little quirks are usually the things that like attract you to that person. And then you're out of the honeymoon phase. And it's those same little quirks that just piss you off. Absolutely. So like I, I had that happen and, um, we, so about, that was about three to four years into the marriage. I had said, Hey, we, we need some help. Like, I, I don't know that we can continue to navigate this on our own. So we actually went to a relationship, uh, counselor and that kind of crashed and burned. So, um, he already had a lot of shame around the fact that he was in his twenties and I was a teenager when we met. Um, so he had a lot of shame just surrounding that. And she, she was a, she was a great counselor in the sense that she really was very nice. She knew what she was doing. However, her delivery of um, what she needed to say was not great. So she ended up telling him like, Hey, you're basically controlling her and treating her as if she is your daughter. And the thing was like, she, she was right about that. That was actually what was happening, but his ego couldn't take it. So he, you know, this was probably two sessions in, he was like, no, she's crazy. She doesn't know what she's talking about. We're never going back. And it was at that, that moment that I was like heartbroken. So I was like, if we don't get this help, we are not going to have a successful relationship. And then, you know, it was probably about seven years of just really awful things that were being done to one another. And it ultimately ended in divorce. And then I met this guy here. Um, How and- long after did you meet the two of you meet? So interesting story. Mm. So we met when she was still married. Yes. Oh, we, we did nothing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. no, I, I didn't need it like that. I just, that's really interesting. Yeah. So I was uh, working with a Czech practitioner and she uh, started working at the local Nuka chiropractor. Mm-hmm. Um, and so <laughs> she was still married at the time. I found her attractive, but I saw the ring. I had done the, the adultery thing in the past. Mm-hmm. I didn't want any part of that. Um, so I, I stayed away. I kept my distance. Yes. Eventually the ring came off and I. And you got confused. I I, I didn't really think anything of it until she sent me a Facebook friend request and and then the rest was history. Yeah. And and here we are. (laughs) But, um, I guess to kind of add on to that, which is really the, the real reason that we got into doing this is we got into our relationship, mind you, I had been divorced that for less than a year. I think I had been divorced at that time for probably about seven months. Um, I had not grieved the end of my marriage. So I kind of was not emotionally available in that regard. And he had, Brian had very severe commitment issues. Up until me, he had ended every relationship right around the two month mark. Um, and so we had that going against us. You know, we that were very interesting inner work to figure that whole thing out. Oh, for out, sure. Yeah. Right. So um, we were very on again, off again, because he, you know, we, we would get close. He would get a little nervous about the connection and he would bail. And then I, you know, I would be heartbroken. And then a week later, I would get that text message from him like, hey, Erica, how are you? And I'm like, this is interesting. It um, was hot, cold dynamic or anxious attachment. Yeah, definitely. A hundred percent. Avoidant. And push, anxious. pull, push, pull, push. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. So we, we have. On the outside, the inside is going, I'm scared, right? Mm-hmm. On both fronts. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So we, we had that dynamic kind of working against us and we had 
uh, I found out I was pregnant. So uh, we had a pregnancy, you know, that, that was, that was happening. We had a baby uh, on the horizons. Um, and then we moved in together. So I think we moved in together once our daughter was born, maybe two months after she was yeah, born. Probably about that. So mind you, he had never lived with a female before. So this was brand new territory for him. So and you're having the, a baby after having a baby being first time parents. So, you know, we're, we're not sleeping. I'm not eating. I'm barely taking a shower because that's just what happens when you have a newborn. So all of that stress, um, and we couldn't get on the same page. We were arguing all the time. Um, there was a time that things with my past marriage, sometimes things would get physical between me and him. I took that baggage into this relationship and I was physical with him at one point, And we kind of made the decision, like we, we need some help again. Um, Brian being in the coaching world already, um, was connected with a husband and wife coaching team. Actually, so it was an individual that turned us on to the couple. But. Okay. Okay. Um, but very similar to what we do. They work together two on two with couples as a team. And I want to say we worked with them for probably about six months, made pretty good improvement, learned a lot of different concepts and learned how to talk to each other, you know, learned nonviolent communication and things like that. And, um, then once we were finished doing the couples coaching, we ended up kind of, um, doing individual coaching. We used the same coach and we just were working on ourselves as individuals and um, continued to improve, continued to grow. Um, and kind of the, the rest became history. Honestly, we just, we got, we got better and better and better as we started learning these things and really um, implementing these different things into our lives. And, you know, now we have a beautiful marriage um, on the same page, moving toward the same goal. Um, but I know my, my thought, which is why I decided to become a relationship coach, is because these things that I was struggling with that I couldn't seem to overcome, um, if I was struggling with it, it meant that other people were struggling with the same thing. Because I was like, I'm not that special. I know that, like, if I'm dealing with it, other people are dealing with it, too. So um, that was that was a big driving driving force for me was that, you know, I have all of this information now and all of this knowledge and I can't keep it to myself. I have to share that knowledge with other people. And, um, I'm, I'm taking all of the time. If you want to jump so in, you're, you're the extra process, <laughs> uh, apparently <laughs> that's great. So, no, thank you. So basically, uh, Brian, then you also, you just decided that you guys were going to do this together because you found it super powerful doing what they call a two on two, meaning mm -hmm. with a couple, they co with the, they come into the coaching session with the both of them and they work as a couple with couples. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that really negates the possibility of what happened with the counselor in her first marriage is, you know, basically one person getting blamed. And I mean, there's always, you know, equal uh, responsibility mm -hmm. in the situation. Um, but it really uh, mitigates any of the kind of the Bias. singularity of blame. Yeah. And you mean blame on to one of the partners? Correct. Yes. Thank mm -hmm. you for clarifying. Okay. And you're saying that the coach would blame a specific partner or the partner would blame? I think that it's a common misconception with counseling. And I think that that's a big distinction between sometimes counseling and coaching, or at yeah. least the way that we do things. We make sure to do things in we go a little bit kind of under the radar. So we're not digging and picking and prodding at the actual problem. We're going under the surface to see if we can first find the tools to be able to learn those tools first and then go to the actual problem while they have these tools. Because, you know, oftentimes we, there's a, there's a, there's a big misconception that once you go into either counseling or coaching, it can be used as these sessions can be used as kind of like hashing things out. Like, well, right. he, he did this and he did that. And, you know, take my side because he's clearly in the wrong. And that's just not, that's not what we do, you know? And the other, one of the other reasons that we decided to work two on two with people is because it helps to really eliminate any potential gender bias. Um, because oftentimes it, you know, we're human. I, I know for me, as, as much as I put in a conscious effort to like not take sides, sometimes I can really relate to the female perspective because 
I have the same perspective. And it's sometimes it can be difficult to see the male perspective. And that's where he comes into play where, you know, like, oh, well, you, you, you see things that way, but why don't you look at it from this point of view? And if I didn't frankly have that other male point of view, I would probably never see it that way. Mm -hmm. So it really helps to just really eliminate the potential of anybody taking sides. Yeah, I, I always love when when we're doing coaching and, you know, I'm, I'm asking some questions and, um, you know, Erica will, will come in and say or ask something. And I'm like, never would have thought of that beautiful mm -hmm. question. And, and it Vice really, versa. Um, so it really helps to to work off each other, really, and 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 take that depth of the the two brains together working versus the one brain. Mm -hmm. And also, like you said, any biases that may come up um, along the way. And, you know, co it, it coaches are to remain non-biased, but I have heard uh, from a few um, friends, their experience in couples coaching, a couples counseling, um, that they felt that the, the, the counselor was biased to one of the partners. And that's something that's a really big deal because a couple should never walk away feeling that the, it doesn't mean that you're not going to push a growth edge in one of actually both of them, but sometimes you're working in a session on one aspect of a, uh, of the partner's growth. Right. And that may take a longer time and need the time of the session. And then the next session, but it's important that the coach is saying, Hey, we're focusing on this growth edge in this session and we will get to him or we will get to her and her growth edge. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's really important, no matter if you're two on two or one on one, or one on two, or one on one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, one on one because one. <laughs> biased. <laughs> Unless you're taking the partner's side, hypothetically. Um, but so yeah, no, it's a very, very important part in coaching. And I do know friends that have had issues with coaches slash therapists that have have really left them, and I'm often shocked at what they're telling me and how biased they are in those, in those, um, uh, sessions. Oh yeah. Yeah. It'll, it'll surprise you for sure. I mean, e even the, the clients that we work with oftentimes we, you know, cause coaching definitely has differences than counseling. And oftentimes we work with people that have tried either the therapy model or the counseling model, and it hasn't worked for them, you know? So sometimes even just hearing those stories, I mean, we've heard, um, I have a, a, a couple that's coming to mind where they were told that they should break up. And, you know, all, all they needed were some, just some tools that that's all they needed. And now they have a happy, strong, beautiful marriage again. Right. Right. And often that's the thing. It's not a therapist or a coach's job to ever tell a couple to break up. We're not there to oh, give no. advice. Yeah. Uh, we're there to help them expand their relationship. Mm-hmm. Or, or come up with their own exactly visions around that. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. Yes. So, what are if maybe giving us? Well, we've talked a lot of, about the benefits indirectly, but what are some of the benefits of premarital coaching? One, like you just mentioned, being able to get to the root of what's going on um, underneath the surface. Yeah. So that we can start addressing it from that perspective and not from the bickering perspective. Yeah, so and that's me. really that, that's really important. And I, I think it's um it, it helps you to really strengthen the foundation of your relationship. That that's really what, in my opinion, it, it's all about. It's you know, strengthening that foundation so that you have more of a more of a shot at a happy, la long lasting marriage, because that's what we want. Nobody goes, you know, walks down the altar thinking like, oh, if this doesn't work, I'll just get divorced. Like right. we don't, we, we don't have, hopefully, hopefully not. not. If we yeah, do, hopefully. we shouldn't be getting married. <laughs> right. right. We all have the dream of being in a long, happy, healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. And when it goes sideways, that's when we want to be able to access the tools in our tool belt or gain the tools so that we can navigate that and is in course correct is safely as possible yeah. safely to the heart and to the relationship yeah yeah 
So how do I know if premarital couples coaching is for me? Are you getting married? I, it's I probably for you. It's for <laughs> <laughs> or no, I'm not ready to get married. I, I just am ready to really commit to my partner long-term. We're not really into marriage, but how do I, I know if this is for it, me? Okay. <laughs> I mean, I think it works the same, whether you're getting married or not, you still need those tools. I know. So for us, we've been together. It's going on nine years. This, um, September. Yeah. So this September. And yeah. we, uh, we didn't get married until just last December. So like we've been together a big chunk of the time. We have been just long-term partners, basically acting as married. We felt that we were married. We wore, wore rings, but we were not legally married. We finally decided to kind of make it, make it legal in December, but you know, whether you're actually walking down the aisle and making it legal or not, to me, it doesn't matter. You still need those tools because either way, these conflicts are going to come up. You know, you, you might be fresh in a relationship now, you know, because you're in the honeymoon phase and things are great. It's rainbows and butterflies and your partner can do no wrong, yeah. but that doesn't last forever. And that's where you need those tools to be able to really um, fully equip yourself to handle those conflicts when they do inevitably arise, because you're going to have conflicts. Yes. And um, I think that that's, really important what you just said because it normalizes that you're going to have conflict in a relationship that that is a normal and it may feel severe at times and I'm not talking about abusive I'm just talking severe mm -hmm. and I think that people that's often when they break up that's often when they break up is when it's just like I always I was talking to an, in another interview about you know it's not supposed to be this hard and it's such a belief that I'm like, where does that come from? Right. It's not supposed to be this hard. I blame Disney, but yeah, a Disney, it's always Disney. It's always <laughs> Disney. You know, it's Disney. It's, you know, it's the wrong Damn Disney. If you are listening <laughs> right now, freaking Disney, but yeah, it's, it's Disney. It's all of the rom-coms that we grew up with. I know I was very much into like the chick flicks. And it really promotes that message of, well, if it's a good, you know, if it's meant to be, you shouldn't be fighting and arguing and it should come easy. It should be effortless. And that is just simply not true. Like you have to put in the effort in order to have that beautiful lasting relationship. Yeah. I like to think of it as like, I think about how hard it is to just be in our own bodies with our own conflicts. And now we take somebody else in their own little conflicts in their bodies and we smash them up together. <laughs> it's like, if you don't have some good, at, good tools to be able to navigate that, um, and it, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be hard. It can actually be fun. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's the uh, Gabby Sudra, who I inter um, I introduced. Um, I think it was back in maybe April. We did an interview, and her take is really how do we make this play? And I think that's so important because it takes the edge off that it has to be hard and so intense. And it's not to diminish actually what's happening. It's just saying, what if we throw in a little play here? What if we make this about a game? Yeah. yeah. And, and so you say that this actually makes me think about how we like to run our sessions. We actually like to have fun in our sessions. So oftentimes when people are considering doing like relationship coaching or counseling, whatever it may be, there can be a fear there because there's generally the idea that this is not fun. You're, you're, you're gonna, you know, feel blamed, whatever it may be. It's often the, the mindset that, man, this is really going to suck. I don't want to do it. This is going to suck. And the way that we kind of structure our sessions, we make sure like we're joking with people. We're having fun. I, I think we were actually talking about this a, a few days ago, how like every single session we are laughing with people because you got to have that element of fun. It, you know, granted, you still have to be vulnerable. Sure. Tears are going to come, at, you know, at times, but you also have to have that element of fun. Otherwise nobody would want to do it. Yeah. I mean, we all, whether it's male or female, we all do and say insane things. And it's oh, absolutely. when you can, when you can laugh at, you know, the crazy <laughs> That's things. That's a really good point, Brian. 
and and relate it with another couple who does the same weird right. stupid insane <laughs> stuff it's you gotta you laugh, get at, to it. laugh at it yeah yes and it lightens doesn't diminish what's happening but it it also is a reminder of how human we are mm-hmm. access to common humanity which is a very important element of we're not alone mm-hmm yeah. And other people are going through this too. Mm-hmm. And other people are getting through this and growing through this too. Yeah. 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 And that's, that's powerful. I know, you know, oftentimes, you know, because we're coaching, we can share our experiences with people and I will share my, my past experiences and the things that I have basically had to go through in order to learn and grow and get to this level And it's amazing the amount of people that are just so incredibly thankful for me sharing that little bit of information and showing them that vulnerability because it really lets them know like, wow, I'm not alone in this. I'm not the only person that has gone through this. Like, look, she went through it and now she's helping us to get through it. Yes. And it's, it's, it's a great way. I love that Erica, because uh, in therapy, there's a, a concept that you don't share some things. And I love that coaching, um, if you choose to share that, it really gives your client hope uh, of what it can look like on the other side. It also has the element of, you know, I've been through this too, and you can get through this too, just like I did, if not better. Yeah. Um, so it really does help a, a couple or individual know what's possible. And it also makes you human. They don't want somebody who's just perfect because right. nobody exists. That's just perfect. They want to know that people have gone through hard things and gotten through it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You have, to, you have to connect with people. Yes. That, that's what it is. You have to, you have to form that connection. Otherwise it, it doesn't feel like it's a good fit honestly, when you don't have some level of connection with people. Yeah. I remember my therapist used to say, um, you know, 90% of therapy or coaching is the relationship you have with the client. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the trust and the rapport. Oh yeah. Because that actually can be super healing in and of itself. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what, uh, what is the secret to really sticking together and boosting, if you could give us one, maybe, uh, to boosting your happiness in a marriage or a long-term partnership? What are some of the things that you found uh, in your own relationship and um, in all the studies that you've done around relationship? I, I think that I, if I think of just our, ourselves and our experience, um, the biggest thing is always putting in the effort and not giving up Um, because I think people give up on their relationship and their marriages too quickly and too easily. And, you know, yeah, it, it's hard sometimes to get through that. It's not fun when we're in conflict with our partner, nobody really wants to fight with your, with your partner and your significant other. It's, it's not enjoyable. However, when you're able to actually get through that, you come out the other side actually stronger. Like a lot of the issues that myself and Brian have had was really awful to go through, but in a way, thank God we went through that and we had those negative experiences because we were able to really band together and come out the other side and really come back as not only stronger individuals that have really grown as individuals, but it has really strengthened our relationship. It strengthened our marriage. Um, Whereas if we didn't have to go through those things, that would never take place. So you're really talking about the willingness to keep showing up in the relationship Mm -hmm. and keep saying yes, making that conscious choice to say, yes, I'm going to keep working on this. I'm willing to do whatever it takes, you know, within healthy boundaries to to make this uh, protect our relationship. Number one, Mm -hmm. protect it treat it as sacred and honor the relationship by continuing to show up and do the work that, or the play slash work to, to, to grow as individuals, but also to grow the relationship. Did you want to speak to that, Brian? Yeah. I mean, I, and certainly communication is probably the foundation of everything, but for me, I always go back to 
kind of the foundation of our program. And that's looking at what do we want to create, particularly mm -hmm. as a team. For me, when we were able to get on the same page and have the same common goal, I would say probably about 60% of our fighting went away. Mm -hmm. And and the, the stuff that we were still fighting about like mattered more than the stuff than, that we were fighting about prior to that. Right. Having that North Star is what you're saying, helps to redirect, draw you back to what is most important and your values and um, the principles that you want to guide your relationship by. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Fantastic. So my next question is what keeps the intimacy and passion going for years? Because that is a big thing I'm sure that you hear as well, um, that there is a loss of intimacy or passion or chemistry that used to be there. Mm -hmm. yep. And that, yeah. that's actually a question that we asked during our consultation process. When's the last time you guys went on a date night? And yeah. usually it's months or years. Usually they can't remember. Yeah. It's actually, it's really sad. We'll, we'll ask people, Hey, when, when is the last time you went on a date? And they're like, Oh gosh, I don't even remember maybe a few months ago. And it's like, wow. So you stopped dating your partner. We should never stop dating our partners. Dating is a forever. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So what, um, how do you help them to, to reignite some of that passion or intimacy? I, I think helping them, first of all, helping them see where, where they went wrong, you know, cause like oftentimes, like, you know, going back to the question of when is the last time you've been on a date, they, it's not in the conscious mind. They're not thinking to something like that because they're thinking of, yeah, well, we well, be on the dating phase, right? Yeah. We're yeah. married now. Or, or you even, just need to love me no matter what I do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Absolutely. That's a big, uh, yeah, you're just supposed to love me no matter what. Well, yes. And what we know from the science of love is love has to be renewed daily. Mm -hmm. Bonds last, love does not. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that work comes out of Dr. Barbara Fredrickson, who studies love. And so right then and there, what you're saying is, how do we daily reignite that love, share that love? What does that look like in one's relationship even? Yeah, and sometimes sometimes we get into our schedules and we're not even remembering. Oops, I think there was a delay. What were you going to say there? I was going to say, I, I started talking and then you kind of stopped and then it was like delayed and went, yeah. <laughs> so, That'll be an interesting replay. It yeah. will be, yes. <laughs> um, and I guess to kind of add on to, you know, what, what can we do on the daily? Because obviously you know, the, the dating is, so can sometimes be tricky. If we're, if we're parents, sometimes we don't have the support of having, you know, maybe we don't have babysitters. Maybe we don't have that luxury of, you know, maybe we don't have the money to pay for babysitters. You know, we, we, we see that in couples often that they just have, they have children and they don't know how to get out of the house just to be alone with their spouse. So sometimes an easy kind of effective way of um, bringing, just more intimacy into the relationship is just by doing daily appreciations. So, you know, every, every single morning sharing a different appreciation, Hey, I really appreciate this about you. I, I appreciate this about your personality. You know, you, you loaded the dishwasher for me today and I am so thankful and appreciative that makes my load so much lighter. Thank you so much. Um, even just doing that one little thing that takes like 30 seconds a day can help to really um, increase the level of intimacy in your relationship. Absolutely. Yeah, they, 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 that just reminds me of that couples often stay together longer, even if it's like satisfactory, the relationship will stay together if they feel appreciated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're not saying go for satisfactory as your, your North Star. Right. No. But <laughs> What we are saying is that appreciation goes a long way. Yes. And satisfactory also beats unsatisfactory. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> On the road to great. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So um, what's the number one thing, um, one question you get 
in your, in your practice, in your coaching practice, like what is the number one question that premarital couples are asking? I, I think the main thing is kind of along the lines of what we were just talking about, you know, what do we do after the initial honeymoon phase has kind of kind of past, like, how do we keep the intimacy alive? I think that's one of the bigger questions that people have, because that's, that's the the thing that people fear the most, you know, I think people can don't worry about conflict and fighting as much as they worry about moving into the roommate stage of the marriage. I think that that is like the big fear that people have. Yeah, that makes sense. That must, yeah. And I, and you hear that a lot. I think that people are fearful. They're going to be in a loveless, whatever relationship and be stuck there. Yeah. Not know what to do. Mm -hmm. So it's like you open the door to what's possible on how to create that. Yeah. Yeah. We, we have, um, we, we have a lot of, um, older couples that we work with as well that, you know, they're, they're retirees and, you know, it, it's, it's so interesting because, you know, when, when you're in your twenties and thirties and you have a baby, your whole life changes. And it's the same after like 65, you go into retirement and your whole life changes, it changes again. So, um, we, we have a lot of couples that are in, in that age range and they're going through that. Like, Hey, we, we don't feel as connected to each other. We, you know, we feel either, we feel like roommates or we're not having sex anymore, you know, whatever it may be. And then once we start pointing out, oftentimes these little things like, you know, an easy communication strategy is just I statements, you know, I feel blank when blank and just starting to do that opens things up tremendously. And, you know, oftentimes they say like, well, we've never, we've never heard that. We've never learned that anywhere. Like, wow, this is amazing. The impact that the, you know, just starting the sentence with the word I, instead of the word you is making. And I love, like, that's what I really appreciate about, you know, talking with you is you guys really distill it down to simplicity and we don't have to overwhelm uh, the clients with all the tools that you really are um, maybe even just giving one tool to, and that's life-changing for the relationship yeah, and for the couple. Absolutely. So I love that. So that leads me to my next question. What's the one tip or suggestion for premarital couples that, uh, what, what would you say is like the best suggestion or tip for these couples? Did you want to <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Deer in the headlights there. Let's, hey, let's go to Brian. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking so much. Yeah, I mean. Sorry. <laughs> No, it's so cool because, you know, you were the more nervous one, right? About this interview. I was, and now I'm the one I knew that we were going to come on here and just go like, bam, 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 bam. And Brian was going to sit back. I knew that was going to happen, the yeah. dynamic. And you just, uh, you, you know, you just really got in your flow. I yeah. did. Yes. It's funny because we got into a little thing beforehand because I was not <laughs> validating her fears of doing this. And <laughs> Uh, so we had to work okay. through that before he, jumping out. What do you know? He was right. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, you, you'll, you'll be fine. You're worrying about nothing. It's just like a conversation. And I was like, no, you are invalidating my feelings and you are acting, you know, it, it was like a whole thing. And he's like, you're, trust me, you, you, you know, your stuff, you're good. Like you're already really outspoken as it is. Cause my whole thing that I was worried about was going to be like, well, what if I don't know what to say? Or what if I start talking and then I don't know what to say after I've started talking? And he was like, trust me, like you don't really have that issue. So that's a cool thing about you, Erica. I know very little, I mean, I don't know you that well, but you have this element of just raw truth and that really comes across. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, I appreciate it because you're not afraid to hold back. And I think that uh, that's really a cool aspect about, and you probably bring that to your coaching. And <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah. And I think people appreciate that because they're like, oh, I don't have to feel like she's perfect and telling me everything about how I should run, you know, not that you're telling, but inviting them into, you know, uh, healing a lot about their relationship or healing a certain part of their um, inner world or integrating uh, that you're just really raw and truthful about and both of you, uh, raw and truthful about, you know, the ups and downs of your relationship, even before this call and, and, and how you were able to navigate that. 
<laughs> before jumping on here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, for, for me, like just about everything is out there. There's not a lot that I'm unwilling to share because I know that my experiences, you know, whether as shitty as they may be, are going to help somebody else. He, he's a little bit more conservative in that regard. So sometimes I have to be like, oh, maybe I shouldn't share that. But um, I'm typically, every everything is out there, open book. Yep. And, and that's a beautiful thing to attract about Erica. Like values stay together. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, mean, that, say, Brian? I was going to say, that's the beautiful thing about, you know, having that polarity in the relationship is she helps to bring me out of my shell and I help to reel in some of the things mm -hmm. that maybe aren't, you know, uh, situationally appropriate. Right. <laughs> Relationally appropriate. That's cute. Um, so Brian, I'll throw that one at you. The number one tip or suggestion for premarital couples. There's no wrong answer. I just, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it really depends on where they're at. Uh, again, I'm really big proponent of having that North Star really mm -hmm. dialed in and knowing what it is you want your, your life and relationship to look like over the next yeah. 10, 10 mm -hmm. 20, 40 years, whatever it may be. Um, and then communication, like it, yeah. it's so cliche. I roll my eyes at myself when I say it, but communication is so, so important. Yeah. It makes what it about communication? What do you think that the, you know, our audience needs to, 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 or would be a benefit to our audience? Like what about communication? Cause you're right. It is cliche, but there's so much depth to that. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think, um, did you want no, to go, go for okay, it? I'm sorry. Um, I, I think one of, if I could give any, any kind of advice or tip or tool with regards to communication, um, it would be look up active listening and reflective speaking. That is a, that will make a huge difference in your relationships and in your marriages because oftentimes one of the, the biggest things that we hear from just about every single couple, typically the woman will say, I don't feel heard. I don't feel validated. He doesn't understand what I'm saying. And when we actually explain how to actively listen to, to each other. So it's, um, it, they've, they've actually done research and studies that the human brain actually checks out of conversations around like 12 to 15 words. So oftentimes what happens, so the, everybody's probably checked out as I'm talking right that. now. <laughs> um, oftentimes what happens is you've got one person that feels particularly passionate about a subject and they're kind of going on and on and on, particularly the feminine, you know, with, with masculine, you know, how was your day? Oh, it was great. I, I had a couple of meetings. It was, it was good. You know, whereas like females or the feminine, we're, we're, we connect by communicating. So, you know, we're, we're coming in and saying, oh, it was great. I went shopping. I bought a new dress here. Let me show you what it looks like. Oh my gosh. Did you hear so-and-so are getting married? Oh, I found this recipe. Look, look at this recipe I found. And it's just, it, it's such a big difference. And as the, the problem with that is as the feminine is speaking, the masculine is just checked out and then the feminine's like, well, what the hell? You're not even listening to me. And when we don't feel heard, we physically raise our voice because we're trying to force the other person to actually listen to us. And then because we're raising our voice, it's triggering for our partner and it ends up turning into an argument. Oftentimes that's why you feel like these simple conversations, you know, that are, don't even mean anything in the grand scheme of things turn into these huge arguments and it's literally because somebody isn't feeling heard or validated. So mm -hmm. just, just a matter of really focusing in on what the person is actually speaking, um, making sure, and this takes conscious effort. I'm not saying that you're going to go out today and have this mastered. I call because them practices. You, yeah, you have to practice this. It, you know, practice makes perfect. But you know what? Making sure that you're not thinking of a response as the person is speaking, because oftentimes that's what happens. Somebody is speaking and you're thinking of what you're going to say in reply. Or if we go back to the masculine, when the feminine starts talking to the masculine, they aren't really listening. They're thinking of how they're going to fix the situation. So it, that's another reason that people don't feel heard. And then as far as the reflective speaking goes, it's kind of mirroring back what you heard your partner say. So just making sure driving home 
the fact that, hey, I hear you and making sure that that we're getting it right as well, making sure that we're checking for accuracy in that too. Yeah, I really like how you talked about um, uh, the, 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 the woman coming home and sharing her whole day. And Alison Armstrong, I think she's amazing and she cracks me up. She's really funny. Uh, and she uh, talks about this with her work with men and women. Mm -hmm. And she'll say uh, that the woman will talk about every little aspect, just like she's picking berries in the field and watching the child and there's all these things happening and she'll go through the whole litany of what happened that day. And the man is trying to understand what's the point, yes. right? Like, what's the point of this story? How is this relevant to me? Yes, <laughs> exactly. And so she says, and it's not verbatim, that to to enter to kindly say, you know, honey, what part of the story do you want me to pay attention to, or what's the most important part of this that I need to to uh, listen to? Yeah, because of what you were just saying, because of that checking out. Yeah. Um, I think that's that's. Uh, a really nice way, or I have 10, I have like five minutes, uh, being able to, to pay attention. And I just want to really hear your, the biggest points to your day that you want me to hear so that I can absorb that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and, and I think just giving people that piece of information that it's just a human trait or characteristic that we check out because oftentimes, you know, you, you've got the woman that's like, I don't know what's wrong with him. He will not pay attention to me. And it's like, it, it's everybody. Like we all have this human trait of checking out of a conversation. We just, we all do it. And they're, you know, it helps to kind of relax them a little bit. Cause it's like, oh, well, it's not just him. Everybody is having this problem, at, you know, as a collective. As a collective, that's a really great point. And, you know, it's um, Harville Hendricks and Helen, uh, talk about um, one not having monologues. That's not a conversation, right? Like these, and, and it happens with couples, like one will be a monologuer and the other one will be sitting there wanting to kill, wanting to like, <laughs> like withdraw. Maybe they do. Yes. And so it's learning how to really be in a dialogue back and forth Mm -hmm. being able to feel heard and seen and felt and validated, right? And also to be able to do that, not necessarily in the same timing, but in, in, in a conversation, being able to do that so that each partner feels heard and validated and seen because what was, uh, there was one thing I was, I, I keep forgetting. I, I usually take like notes, but I don't want to look down every time, but it was in regards to um, most of the time people are not listening. Right. And that's what uh, Harville say. Most of the time we are, we're not actually listening mm -hmm. and we're often preparing ourselves to speak. Yeah. I think I, I am probably going to butcher this statistic. I know, I know half of it for sure, but I know <laughs> I the first right. part of it, um, <laughs> I think that it's around like 25%, um, we're actually hearing from what our, what our partner says. And if we are in, that's the one that I'm not sure about. It could be give or take. So don't quote me on it. Um, the no. other part of that, if we are activated in any way, 0%. So yeah. that's why the argument ends up turning into this massive thing because we're already activated. We're not thinking clearly. So if we're not thinking clearly, how are we going to actually listen to what the other person is trying to say? We're, we're getting 0% out of what they're saying. That's why I guess that would be my other little piece of advice. When you are in a conversation and things are getting heated and you start to feel any kind of activation, you know, this could be, you know, you're, you're, you're sweating, your face is flushing, your heart's racing, um, anything that you feel that you're like, okay, I'm getting overwhelmed, take a time out, take 20 to 30 minutes, get away from the conversation, go do something relaxing, do, you know, meditation, do some breathing, listen to music, read a magazine. The only thing that you cannot do is sit and stew and how pissed off and how wrong your partner is, because that's going to fire you up. And you're going to come back to the conversation 30 minutes later and be like, <laughs> I already thought this out. And let me tell you why you're wrong. Exactly. Not gonna Beautifully get said, Erica. <laughs> Beautifully said. Yes. Yeah. I call it going to the green zone. 
Like, how do we get our nervous system to uh, self, you know, being able to self-regulate and, and turn the heat down, turn yes. the heat down. Yeah. Absolutely. Beautiful. Yes. The self-regulation component is really important because then we can either we can either stay in that red zone, which we've shut off critical thinking. So you're very ineffective. That's why it drops, like you were just saying. And we're not able to, we're, we're, we're not useful at doing, at, at having a conversation when we're in the red zone at all. No, look, at, no. look at Brian. He's like, no, I think you have know, you know, familiarity with that, zone. Brian. Do you have some familiarity with that? I could see that like in the back, there was like a wealth of wisdom. Maybe a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to say more uh, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> that plays into like erica's always willing to share everything and he's like mm, i'm okay <laughs> <laughs> you guys have been fantastic are there anything that i didn't ask you that you would like to share at this point mm, we covered a lot yeah we did yeah, yeah. The only thing I guess that comes up to my mind is just another quick statistic as far as the um, premarital coaching goes. So um, don't I don't I don't know the actual research, but I do know the the percentage. So couples that have done any kind of premarital course, so this is like whether it's coaching, counseling, whatever it may be, actually have thirty percent more satisfaction in the relationships versus the couples that didn't do anything. So that's another big part of why we decided to start opening up our business into doing premarital coaching as well. Um, just cause it helps to, it, it, you know, it's a win-win you're basically working against, you know, that 50% divorce rate that we have here in the U S. Yeah, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. And that's a huge impact on the relationship. 30% is a huge impact. Yes, it is. If you could increase your productivity, 30%, who would say no to that? Right. I'm just doing it as a comparative. Um, if you could be 30% happier and healthier and thriving in your relationship, who would say no to that? Right. Yeah. I mean, if you think of it as like an employer or like, you know, major corporation, if you go to any, any, you know, big boss or CEO and say, Hey, I can boost productivity and like efficiency by 30%. They're going to be like, where do you sign me up? Let's get everybody doing this course. <laughs> Absolutely. I was out. Um, I met a new, a, a new friend in the building just to, to, I live in Manhattan. So, you know, it's like very close little block. So I met this new person. My dog always introduced me to new people. <laughs> and so we are talking and she, she was asking what I do. And I was sharing that, you know, I'm a relationship and couples coach. And she was like, Oh, she was like, you know, this is really interesting. She's from Iran. And she said, in Iran, the younger people, it's a common understanding that when you start a relationship, you get coaching. Mm, interesting. Wow. And I said, that is fascinating because she was basically saying, we know the benefits and we know we can't do this alone and we want to make it the best possible relationship. Wow. And I, was, I said, what? I said, that is so fascinating. I would have never thought, you know, I said, I think as Americans in America, we need to kind of shift some of this. Um, yeah. I think in the traditionally Christian culture, there is like, that's kind of the biggest place for premarital counseling yes. is yes. The, church. Let's the church. So much of, you know, the, the country and the world has moved away from, from religion and that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of, that's uh, a good point, Brian, um, hindering the, uh, yes. hindering that. and even with that, I just want to make a, a quick point about that, um, is, from what I, from what I've heard from couples that I have done, you know, some kind of counseling through the church, it's not as in depth as I think it really should be. You know, I don't think that they're learning the same tools, you know, usually from, from my understanding of it, you know, if somebody's had a different experience, then please forgive me. But, you know, the majority of people that I've spoken to have said, you know, we've had maybe two sessions. They say, okay, you're good to go. Yeah. We're, we'll, we'll marry you. I know, I know for me, in order for my first marriage, in order for um, the, the the priest to marry us, we had to go through a count, like a, a couple's hey. counseling. However, it was basically 
you know, one day of just asking kind of random questions and then basically saying like, oh yeah, you're, you're good. We'll, we'll marry you. You're okay. But like, we never got any kind of like tool. We never learned how to communicate. We never learned, you know, nervous system rate regulation, never learned any of the really important parts of it. Do you have values that align or values mm -hmm. that don't align that are you know, kind of deal breakers yeah. for the relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. And I, I actually, when you said about uh, uh, religious uh, associations and having that um, built into the culture, that made me think about a little bit more about the conversation I had with the, the woman from Iran because she had said that uh, arranged marriages were still happening. Mm -hmm. So if they weren't arranged, what I understood is that they would get support mm. to be able to build the relationship, okay. that it was not a traditional arranged marriage. Wow. Interesting. A lot of the value work is done with the arranged marriages. Is, I, I'm no expert in this area, but what I understand is a lot of the values are already um, aligned because of the parents choosing based on values, based on the family, and based on a number of other things. But so I thought that was very, very interesting conversation. Um, I'm sure it was. was super and when you said about uh, a, a Christian um, uh, faith and, and the, the culture of the Christian faith, yeah, that is built in within the... the um, the, the the wedding procedure. nomination yeah. yeah was searching for a word yeah. <laughs> you guys how can people reach out to you can you give us a little information on that yeah um so facebook um you can find us at be connected relationship um coaching yes be connected yeah. relationship coaching be yes be so brian erica and um, we're also on Instagram. So handle is at Be Connected Relationships. Uh, TikTok is the same at Be Connected Relationships. Um, no website yet. Basically, we're just operating everything off of Facebook right now. Okay, great. And um, we'll put those links in the, the replay. So this will automatically replay. But then I'll go back in and I'll make, uh, I'll edit some things and you can it just, uh, if you guys can just send me the the handles and the tags and I'll put those in there. So oh, people can. Perfect. Yes. Thank you so much for being here. This was so fun spending this hour with you guys. It went by so quickly. Yeah. I hope that you all enjoyed it out there. We're so glad and grateful to have you with us. So um if you want a two-on-two -two couples coaching, uh, you know how to now reach Brian and Erica. And uh, any last words before we close? Um, my only thought is if you do have interest, we do offer all couples a complimentary consultation. So mm -hmm. sit down for about a half hour, maybe an hour and uh, dig in, find out what's going on and see if uh, it wouldn't be a good fit working together. That sounds great. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right, so here's the magic technician coming in. Um, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna end the live. Uh, let, let's do this. Uh, stop the live.